Saturday to focus in on the goal of winning souls, and uh, stay tuned, it's coming back soon. Can you say amen? So let's turn our Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew chapter 16. Please join me in Matthew chapter 16. I want to review with you a familiar scripture, uh, and one that sometimes we skip over without thinking about too, too much, and that's, we, we're, we're guilty of that very often in the Bible. Reading the words, but not fully comprehending the meaning or the implication behind it. What we cannot deny in 2020 is that we are living in the midst of one of the most offended and offensive generations in, in, uh, in modern history. This is what Jesus exactly predicted about the end times. He said, Matthew 24, verse 10, many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Let me ask you, is that more true today than it was six months ago? 100%. These are signs of the times. Jesus also said in Matthew 18, verse 7, Woe to the world because of offenses. Offenses must come. How many understand in life, offenses must come? But woe to the man by whom the offense comes. I was curious about that word that Jesus used, offenses. Do you know what the literal word in the Greek actually is? Have you ever seen a hunter who lays a trap for an animal? There, if there is a trap and then uh, if, it's a, if it's a basket that's held up by a little twig, and if the animal goes underneath the basket, kicks out that little twig, the basket falls on top of him and the hunter has gotten his dinner, right? So the word offense is exactly the same as the Greek word for that little twig. It means the trigger that causes a trap, a snare. It is a trap stick, it is, it, and, uh, and by extension, metaphorically, it means something that is put in the way that causes us to stumble, to fall, or to be trapped. The word is scandal. It's the same word that we get our English word, scandal. And how many understand that offense is a reason for us to fall into a trap? Now, I understand this morning there are some things in life that you must be offended about. Evil, injustice, it is okay to be offended when real abuse is occurring. I am offended by abortion. I am offended by murder. I am offended when other people take other people's stuff, theft, that is offensive. Not only to me, but to God. Can you say amen? amen? By the destruction of property, that is offensive. And no doubt, every single one of us has had reason to be offended in these last few weeks and months since the unrighteous death of George Floyd. And I believe that in our midst, in our culture, and in the Western world generally, there has been loosed a spirit of offense. Now I want to take a moment to kind of step back from the, from the, uh, from the arguments and from the division that is being caused. And I want to ask you to join me as we begin to see this spirit of offense from a heavenly perspective, and what is it and who is it that is causing this to occur? In our scripture that we're about to read, Jesus gets offended. But instead of allowing that offense to further divide him and his disciples, what he does is magnificent. He properly identifies the source of the offense, and that is what we need to do this morning. Please pay close attention to this scripture. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter, verse 22, took him aside and began to rebuke him. Do you think that Peter liked what Jesus told them? No, he didn't like that at all. That did not fit in with Peter's agenda or his plan. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And as I've said before, be careful if you find yourself rebuking Jesus. You might not be on the right side of the argument. But when he rebuked Jesus, he said, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he, Jesus, he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, say it out loud, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So interesting and so so enlightening that Peter is not the enemy in the story. Peter is not the source of the offense, but Peter is the vehicle for offense. And when Jesus turns to rebuke him, he does not address him as Peter, but identifies the true source of offense, who is Satan. The enemy of our souls. The one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And Jesus directs his counterattack to the place where it needs to go, not against Peter specifically, but against Satan. You are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. I want to pray for just a moment and ask God's hand to be in this service and help us all in this place. And we thank you, Father, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for the Spirit of God that unifies and brings your church together. God, you are the God who overcomes every division. You are the God who brings us together at the cross. And I'm praying right now that Your Word would help us once again to take our place as the church, to take our place as the influencer of this culture and this society. God, may Your people today, may we be the ones identifying the offense and the offender. And we thank You, Lord, for all that You are going to do in Jesus' mighty name. Can you say? Amen. Now let's look at this text for just a moment. Jesus, we know, is having a little powwow, a little meeting with his disciples. What's interesting to me is that Satan is nowhere to be seen, right? Before Jesus utters his name, Satan is not part of this story, at least from from the point of view of those who are there. What is happening in our natural eyes, we are not able to see, is that Satan has infiltrated this meeting. Satan is stirring up thoughts and emotions that do not agree with what Jesus is saying. Are you understanding what is happening in this Scripture? As the disciples have come together, Jesus is telling them the perfect, the plan of God, the will of God, the Word of God, and what they do not realize yet is that Satan's along for the ride. See, I believe that Satan is in on many church services. If not Satan himself, then he sent a few of his little demon soldiers to come and sit in empty chairs. See, that's why we got to fill the churches up. Because demons come and sit in the empty chairs when they're empty. And they come in and they begin to observe and they begin to strategize And they begin to uh, infiltrate what God is trying to do. How many understand that God has a will for our lives? God has a will for our church. God has a will for our marriages, for our families, for our businesses. God has a will for our finances. See, and life is good when we follow the plan of God. Have, Have you figured that out already? Life is good when you figure out and you follow the plan of God. But see, God's plan is not the only plan. 
There is also an enemy plan. There is also a strategy of Satan. And what is Satan's strategy here at this critical juncture in the ministry of Jesus? The, the goal of Satan is to divide Jesus and his disciples. There is a purpose at work. There is a plan afoot to divide Jesus uh, and disciples amongst themselves. This is the offense that Jesus identified. Satan was using Peter to try and get the disciples to rebel against the Father's will for Jesus. Now, to the natural eye, it seems to make sense. Peter looks at the situation and he doesn't even realize that his emotions and his mind is being manipulated by Satan. He, doesn't know, he does not even know that because that's what Satan's really good at. He is good at firing little darts into your mind and say, Ha! Huh, that makes sense. Why isn't it like this or that? And this is what many times God's people fail to understand is that thoughts and emotions that bring division oftentimes have been lit on fire by hell. It was Peter speaking, but it was Satan's message. Here are some questions that I want you to ask yourself right now. Is it possible that Satan still influences people's thoughts and emotions today? Is it possible that he still influences people's actions today? And is it possible that Satan is still speaking through people and they're not aware of it? Just like Peter. The answer to those questions are yes, yes, and yes. Not only is it possible, but it is happening in our nation, in our churches, in our families, and in marriages on a daily basis. As we look at what's happening and what has happened for the last few weeks in our nation, it is time for believers to look at the one behind the scenes pushing the buttons. Did you ever have that member of your family that pushes people's buttons? Maybe a brother or a sister. I know who it is in my family. I'm not going to call them out right now. But there's one of our... <laughs> One out of the two of our daughters who sometimes likes to push buttons just to see what will happen. Do you have a family member like that? I'm not saying that they're Satan. I'm just saying. There is someone in our culture who enjoys to push the buttons. Who stands behind the scenes and pulls the strings. And I believe it is time for us today, like Jesus did, to see beyond the face of Peter and identify the strategy behind the words. To see the words behind the words. To see the heart behind the face. Right? Peter was speaking, but Jesus said, that's not you, Peter. That's Satan speaking through you. He said, get behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me. You have offended me, Satan. He, knew, he wasn't speaking to Peter here. Yes, we know Peter, just a vehicle. And probably Peter felt a little bit of that, didn't he? But Jesus' rebuke was not directed at Peter. It was directed at Satan. Why? Why was this response so offensive to Jesus? The offense was that Jesus came to do the will of the Father. John 5, verse 30. He said, I seek not my own will, but I seek the will of the Father who has sent me. And Jesus knew from the beginning that it was the Father's will for Him to go to the cross, for Him to pay the price of salvation, for Him to bear the weight of sin and death and conquer over it. But the words that came from Peter's mouth contradicted God's clear and present will. 
that was offensive to Jesus. That was offensive. It went against the will of the Father. So as everyone by now knows, all four of the police officers involved in the death of George Floyd, they've all received criminal charges and are pending uh, action in the courts. There has been looting and rioting that has erupted as a result of his death, which has also led to the death of at least four police officers, the death of a retired 77-year-old police officer, and other, many other injuries. And what is so sad to me is that all of this chaos has overshadowed and many times has delegitimized the peaceful protests, which I fully support. The chaos and the anarchy and the, and, and, and the, 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 the violence that is occurring, it many times overshadows. It, doesn't, it, it saddens me that this happens, but it doesn't surprise me. And there are a lot of things that should bother us, the church, about this situation. I think, firstly, we need to be bothered that there are many in the church that are ignorant of where the violence is coming from. The violence and the murder and the looting and the the, the theft and, and this anarch, this spirit of anarchy that has been loosed, that all comes from below. Satan, the devil, the deceiver, the Bible calls him the old dragon. We should not expect the world to understand this. We should not expect Fox News to understand this. We should not expect CNN or MSNBC or, any new, or even politicians. We should not expect them to understand where it's coming from. But we should understand. Because violence is not the kingdom of God. Secondly, we should be bothered that in the midst of all of the chaos and confusion... There are not many Christians that I see pointing out the real enemy here. Pointing out the face behind the face. See, our enemy is is not some person that's on CNN or some leader. See, our ultimate enemy, how many understand, is the same enemy that Jesus had. And he is the one that we need to be directing our anger at. The third thing we need to be upset about is that the church seems to be oblivious in our generation and we are becoming many church I don't want to say we as our church but I want to say that many churches are becoming oblivious are becoming useless we are salt that is losing its savor be and why I say that is because the church ought to be a place where we come together to worship God, to care about one another, and to win the lost. But when we are divided among ourselves, when there is tension and strife, what happens is we become completely ineffective, and the devil says, yes, I did it. See, this is a spiritual attack. This is a spiritual attack that is happening to the church of Jesus Christ. And we ought to be engaged, on alert, and aware of how Satan is operating. See, Jesus gave us everything we need to know to understand about the kingdom of hell. We understand him. We ought to. And if we don't, it's because we have not read the word of God. John 10, verse 10, Jesus called him out. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That is his M.O. That is, that are, th- those are his marching orders, and everything that Satan does has that end goal in mind. To kill you, to steal your destiny. To destroy your life and everything that is good in it. Can you say amen? And nobody compares to him. That is not an understatement. There is nobody better at manipulating 
the issues of life, the emotions of man, the words that we speak, the devil, just like God uses people for his will. How many know the devil can use people for his will too? What the enemy does is he takes these situations that we have encountered in the last few weeks and he takes good and, and, and people who don't know any better and he pours gasoline on the fire. Emotions, rage, bitterness, accelerant, the accusation of racism. Have you seen it accelerate in the last few weeks? Racism hiding behind every rock and under every blade of grass. What is that? What is the strategy? That is the strategy of hell to bring division. Now, I am not saying that racism does not exist. Of course it does. It's still around in small pockets. I'm not minimizing the role that it plays and how it has played into certain situations in our nation. But that is not what I'm preaching about today. What I am preaching about is how Satan cleverly uses the accusation of racism like a gasoline on the fire, causing divisions to stoke, causing mistrust, not just in our society, but right here. We need to get something straight in our minds today. I need to get something straight in my mind today. That the devil could possibly use my words to bring division. I need to be on guard against that. The devil could possibly use my social media if I repost something. And I don't realize that the devil may be using that. That's why we have to be constantly led by the Spirit. Can you say amen? Constantly in communication with the Lord. See, everything Satan does is he is primarily aimed at weakening the church. And he has been very successful at that. Weakening its power. Weakening its ability to win souls. Weakening its ability to make disciples. Weakening our ability to make a difference with the time that we have. See, nobody else matters to the strategy of hell. Do you know why? Do you know why his main goal and purpose is to hurt the church? Because people who are lost, they're already on his side. Right? People who are lost in the world, people who are not Christians, he has to do nothing to win them because he's already won them. So his attack and his strategy is directed, it wasn't directed at King Herod. His strategy in our scripture was not directed at Pontius Pilate. He's like, yeah, I already got those guys in my back pocket. But the strategy was directed at the disciples. The strategy of Satan was to manipulate and the thoughts and the intents and the words of Peter to bring division even in the circle of disciples among Jesus Christ. And if it's, if it's a possibility there, don't you think it's still a possibility here? Jesus taught in Mark chapter 3, verse 24, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. This is what the devil aims to do. He aims to make churches a place where we cannot stand. Cannot stand for anything. It's really a warning to the body of Christ. Where there is schism, where there is division, where there is a bickering, where there is a mistrust, where there is a bitterness, where there is unforgiveness, there, there is also an unwillingness work together for the kingdom. 
And so, this is why Satan directs his attacks against the church. Against pastors. Against people in the pews. Against those in leadership. And what does he do? What is he doing right now? I think he's, he's down there in his pit. Saying, ooh, look what I got cooking now. Look at what we've been able to accomplish together, my friends. And the sad truth is that hell is far more unified than the church. It's time to do something about this. It's time to, 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 to see the evil for what it really is. It's time to see that that brother that posted something that I don't agree with, he's not the true enemy. And then I shouldn't be angry at him. And I shouldn't, uh, uh, I shouldn't hold uh, biases under the surface. Instead, I should pray. You know, the devil, he cannot stop the people of God when we pray. Instead of blowing up Facebook, maybe we could sit down for five or ten minutes and pray. How many understand? Blowing up Facebook will accomplish zero. Nothing. Except it might make you feel a little bit better. But when you get on your knees, and when you call out to God for that brother who posted something, or that sister that posted something that you don't like, or that I don't like, or that nobody likes, when you pray for that person, do you know what happens? Supernatural things begin to happen. The influence of hell over their mind begins to change. That's why it's so important that Jesus... Yeah, we know that Peter was, was, was on the receiving end of a rebuke, but he was not the one being rebuked. The enemy of our soul loves these times when the church, and he's just down there saying, bravo, good job guys, keep up the great work. Cause for celebration, open the, open the champagne bottles boys. Look at what's happening in the church today. Light up a cigar. Because the church is dividing. And when the church is dividing, how many understand there is no other enemy that Satan has? When the church is divided, when the house cannot stand, the devil, he gains ground in our world today. So how can we help? What can we do? We need to pray, as I mentioned. We need to stand in the gap. We need to take the Word of God and proclaim it against the chaos and the confusion. See, this is what Jesus did, the strategy. When Satan came to tempt him in the wilderness, you know the story. And as Satan came and, and gave him three temptations... And each time the temptation was issued, how did Jesus respond? He said, it is written. He knew the Word of God and He applied it to His immediate situation. That's the problem with Christians who don't read their Bible and who don't study their Bible, is they cannot apply the Word of God to what is happening right now. It is written. Jesus defended every strategy of hell with, it is written, the will of God is this. No, Peter, you have offended me. Satan, you have offended me through Peter because this is the will of God. The moment that he saw the counterfeit, he said, oh no, that's not the real thing. This is the real thing. Have it, anybody ever tried to pass off a counterfeit bill on you? One time I was, uh, I was trying to sell something on OfferUp. I think it was a computer. And I was asking for $600. And so I put it on there and a guy messaged me and he says, yeah, hey, I want to check out your computer. Can we meet together? 
And I said, sure. So I met him up at a Starbucks, and, and I brought out the computer, and he's looking at it, he's typing, and he's, yeah, it's pretty cool. And then he pulls some money out of his pocket, and he hands it to me, 600, six $100 bills. And then I looked at him. Something felt a little weird. And then I looked real close. I said, wait a second. It's not even the right color. It doesn't feel, you know how money has kind of like that fabric-y feel to it? Well, this felt more like, like paper than, than that fabric -y. and And I started, and, and, and then I held it up to the light, you know, and it, and it didn't have that little security strip in there. I was like, hey, man, are you, you, you trying to pull one over on me or what? And he played this little thing like, what? What? Are they not real? He said, yeah. He said, I just got them from the bank. I had no idea. I was like, all right, buddy. All right, come back, find me again when you get six real $100 bills. <laughs> Thankfully, I looked at him before the transaction was over. But see, the problem is, I would never have known that it was a counterfeit if I didn't know the real thing already. The only reason that I knew a fake $100 bill is because I have seen the real $100 bill. Only a few times. But when you see the real thing, then the counterfeit becomes obvious, doesn't it? What we are seeing in our world today is a counterfeit. And there are not many Christians, there are not many people, and my prayer is that you would be one of them today to say, no, this isn't right, this is not God's will, we want the real thing. Let's close this morning by turning to Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to just remind you how it is that you and I can effectively fight against a spiritual enemy. So many things are spiritual that we don't realize. So many battles that we perceive. We think that they're political, but they're more spiritual. We think that battles divide among racial tensions or color, uh, skin color. And yet so much of it, we don't realize, is a spiritual battle. Look at what Ephesians says in chapter 6, verse 10. The Apostle Paul identifies the real enemy. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Strategies of the devil. The ways and the purposes of the devil. See, you're not going to be able to do this out of your intellect or out of your experience. See, we, we can't fight against the devil. We cannot confront the offenses of hell simply with a, with a meme or a post. We are, if we are going to be successful against the wiles of the devil, you will have to be a spiritual person. Put on the whole armor of God. Why? Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That means this is not a human struggle. This is not a struggle of flesh. This is not just a struggle of ideas or uh, cultures. This is not just a, a struggle of opinions. No, this is a struggle of principalities, powers, and against rulers of darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And that, beloved, is why we need to take up the whole armor of God. That's why the answer to all of this is found in prayer and fasting. Because when you pray and when you fast, you get closer to Jesus. And when you are closer to Jesus and led by the Spirit, then you are able to stand against spiritual enemies. Your enemy is not a Democrat or a Republican. Your enemy is not Donald Trump or Nancy Pelosi. Your enemy is not a black guy or a white guy. Your enemy 
is the devil, and he is using all of those people and the words that they speak to divide us. So when you get offended, instead of snapping back and saying, well, I'm going to be twice as offensive back to you, what we ought to be doing is calling out Satan for the strategy behind the words. Satan, you get behind me. Peter, you're on my side. But Satan, you get behind me. Because the words that you are speaking through my friend over here are not right. They go against the will of God. We are the only ones, church, who can enforce victory on the, on the one that Jesus has already defeated. How many understand that the devil, he is already a defeated foe? He has already been stomped upon by the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, verse 15 says, Having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In other words, Jesus already won the victory. The battle's already won. But it's up to you and I to enforce it. The law has already been passed in Congress. But now it needs to be enforced. And that's our job. The problem is many of us, we forget that the devil can be like a puppet master in this world. We don't recognize his attacks. We don't recognize his movements. We don't recognize it because we are not led by the Spirit. We fall for the counterfeit. And we think all that we can see are the people unwittingly executing his plans. We have to stand up against this evil church. We have to exercise the authority that we have as the sons and daughters of God. We have to confront the enemy of our soul. We have to be reminded that we are only effective when we are together. We are only effective when we are unified in the body of Christ with Him as our head and all of us being His hands and His feet. And if you chop off a hand or chop off a foot, how many know that does not help? Jesus responded to the temptations of hell by saying it is written. So what is written for us today? John 6, verse 63. It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are Spirit and they are life. I believe, you know, when, we, when, we, when this time passes by and maybe when we all get to heaven and look back on 2020, you know what we're going to say? Why didn't the church stand up? Why didn't the church take its place? Why didn't the people of God come together? It is when we pray and when we speak the Word of God into our lives, into our country, into our culture. We need to speak the Word of God. We need to speak the plan of God. Jesus, when He confronted Peter and the words of the enemy behind Peter, He said, no, 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 this is not the will of God. It is an offense to me. When we pray, when we speak, we are speaking for God. Ezekiel 22, verse 30 said this, I sought for a man among them that they should... Make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Is God searching today? Is He searching for a man, a single person, man or a woman, anybody, who would stand in the gap for the land? Can I tell you, he's still searching. See, if the country continues on this path, it will be destroyed. I've read several articles already that say the, that when monuments start to come down, it's the path that leads to civil war. Who 
who will stand in the gap? Will the church rise up and take its place? So amazing about this scripture in Ezekiel 22.30. When God says, uh, I sought for a man who would stand in the gap before me. The original language there, it's not the prayer that says, uh, God, I'm facing you so that I can speak to you about this problem. But in the Hebrew language, it means that the, the faith, it, the, it's the image of two people standing in agreement, looking together. The Lord who's looking for someone who would stand together with Him on behalf of a land that is in tragedy. That means we have to align ourselves with God. My prayer is that we can speak life, not death. My prayer is that we would be able to rebuke the proper spiritual sources of the lies that are being told. My prayer is that we would suit up some spiritual armor. The shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. The enemy wants to divide us, and he's been doing a pretty good job lately. But I'm not having it. Let's end it. Let's unify in our worship of God, in our care for one another, and in our mission to the world. And the enemy will not be able to stop us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning as we bring the service to a close. My aim this morning, of course, is not to minimize injustice. We all stand together where justice is necessary and needed. But at the same time, we must recognize that the enemy uses situations like this and douses every one of these news stories and social media, douses it with lighter fluid to cause it to be inflamed and divisive. My prayer is that somebody here would recognize the true enemy. The true enemy behind the scenes, pulling the strings, pushing the buttons. Coordinating against the church of Jesus Christ because that is his true enemy. The true enemy of the devil is not the news media, it's not social media. It's not a political organization. The church of Jesus Christ is His true enemy. And today, before we do anything else, I want to ask you, are you here today? You're not right with God, but you want to be. Is it the, the case that the devil has lied to you and told you that everything's alright? You don't need salvation. You don't need to serve God. Everything's cool. Everything's not cool as long as you're not serving Jesus. The wide, easy road leads to destruction. There's a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to destruction. And I'm here today to proclaim to you the gospel of Jesus, the good news that you don't have to be destroyed by your own sin. You can turn to the Lord Jesus. You can repent of your sins. You can have them forgiven today. You can walk in freedom and in newness of life, you can be made new. New creation. In Jesus' mighty name today, if you will turn from your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that you quickly this morning? You're here in this place, or maybe you're watching on our live stream, and the honest truth is that you desperately need God's forgiveness. Would you turn to Him today, before it's too late? Would you turn to Him? Would you make a public declaration? Is that you? I would love to pray with you today. Would you lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I know I'm not right with God. I know the enemy has me in his back pocket. 
And I know today I need, desperately, I need His grace and mercy. Is that you? Quickly, let me see your hand. Anyone at all? Backslider, you've been running from God. Can I see your hand? It's time to get right with the Lord. It's time to return home to the Father's house. Is that you? Let me see your hand. I want to pray with you. If you're, on, if you're online, watching on live stream, don't, don't let this moment pass. Respond in a comment. We'll reach out to you and pray with you. Right now, I want to pray for the church. I would like us all to join together in prayer. I would like us all this morning to be unified in our acknowledgement of who the real enemy is. We might not be in agreement on all things. As long as we are human beings, we will have disagreements. We will have opinions that cross one another. But what we will always have is we have one Father. We have one Savior. We have one will of God that we are all pursuing together. And at the cross, we can find unity. So I want to pray this morning. I want to believe God that we can properly identify the true source of division and strife and backbiting and bitterness. And where it causes division. Listen, the mathematics of supernatural things, God adds and multiplies. The enemy subtracts and divides. And He is here. He is, his plan has been working to perfection in the last few weeks. I'm praying that there are people here who would hear the call. Say, Lord, I want to dedicate my life to pursuing Your will 